Great. Welcome, welcome, everybody, on a wonderful Saturday afternoon when I know everybody would be getting ready to uh, be at Oshkosh in about two days. Um, but here we are at the virtual Osh, and uh, we appreciate everyone's time today, Saturday, uh, to, for, for, uh, for the webinars, for those that were here earlier, for Chris's and, and uh, Kristen's in a few moments. A um, couple house, uh, house cleaning order things here. First, we want to thank Aircraft Spruce for uh, sponsoring our webinars yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, for those that have been to the gathering at Wapaka, you know what it's all about. We've been doing this for the last 16 years. It's uh, 26 nautical miles away from Oshkosh. It's phenomenal. All of our supporters, or many of our supporters that want to do a presentation are there. They're at our gathering in front of a lot of people. This is a picture of last year's gathering at Wapaka. And all these people, it's kind of uh, going in a little bit. They're all, we have so much fun. They're all, they show up on a Friday. We're there Friday, Saturday, some on Thursday. Sundays are the big conversations. We typically host all of these seminars in one day. But obviously with COVID, we're here. We decided to uh, spread it out for three days because it's kind of hard to sit in the chair for eight hours straight. But this is what we do. We've been doing it for 16 years. A lot of our supporters, companies, uh, advertisers want to be there. They want to be in front of you guys, our audience. And we appreciate, we appreciate them. We appreciate you uh, because it's because of members like you, we're, we're here and we've got Kristen and, and, and Steve Ellis, all these people that work and write for us and are contributing editors put together the best content for you guys. And we appreciate you being here on a Saturday to, to listen to Kristen's uh, Logbooks 101. Um, so we, we know that. I think at this point, I'm gonna probably hand the floor over to Kristen. So she'll discuss things. Now hang around till the end, type your questions in. That's, that's how we finish this off. Um, and you will have Kristen's contact at the end. You'll have a slide with her email. If you've got any questions that you want to come up, you, you thought of something tonight and you're like, oh, I, I, want, I wanted to ask this, send her an email. Say, hey, I got a question. What about this problem or scenario with a logbook? Uh, what, what are your suggestions? Um, and she'll be happy to answer them. Um, so to that, I hand the floor over to uh, Kristen Winter. There's okay. Well, um, welcome to uh, the uh, re replacement uh, Opaca. I w this was going to be my first year, so I'm very disappointed that uh, didn't get to do this in person, but uh, uh, this is almost as good. So anyway, we're going to talk about logbooks. So welcome to the lost world of general aviation maintenance uh, record keeping. Uh, between mechanics uh, who became mechanics to get away from having to do paperwork and owners that don't really realize that they're responsible for the um, uh, maintaining the uh, maintenance records of their aircraft, uh, this is an area of ownership that has been long neglected. Uh, we're going to take a look at what the FAA requires. We're going to take a look at what mechanics responsibility is to make logbooks. We're going to talk about what the um, what logbook entries should look like and rarely do. Um, we're going to look at the uh, owner and operator's responsibility for maintaining the records as a whole. And finally, we will look at some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the actual um, maintenance entries that I have collected over the years of doing pre-purchase inspections. Anyway, just by way of introduction, uh, as you can see, I'm Kristen Winter. Uh, and I bought my first airplane in 1986 and have bought and sold uh, for my own uses and assisted uh, dozens of other people with pre-purchase inspections, logbook reviews, uh, et cetera, pretty much since then, so for about 35 years. Um, so I've had an opportunity to look in, at an awful lot of logbooks. Um, and I have to say that um, in general, overall, uh, they're in a fairly sorry state. So anyway, first of all, we need to probably uh, clear up a few definitions um, that the FAA uses that you ought to know about. Uh, the first is people often don't really understand 
what it is that they have to track time-wise on their aircraft. By FAA definition, maintenance is determined by time in service. Now, normally we use TAC times for that or we use HOBs, um, and those technically aren't correct because time in service is the liftoff of the ground to when it touches down. And if you notice on, on older logbooks, they basically kind of expect, oh, uh, the format of, of old paper logbooks is they expected you to enter in each flight the time that you got off and the time you got on. I think that is a holdover from the military and is a whole lot easier if you have a co-pilot than if you're flying yourself, which 99% of us are. Um, so you have to understand that um, Hobbs running off the engine is not necessarily co quite correct. Um, and, and tachometers, not technically correct either, but the FAA has pretty much accepted that for, you know, decades and decades. Um, but to be completely accurate, um, nowadays with some of the GPS units, you can hook it to, uh, you know, they're, they're set to calculate the actual time you are in the air. Um, and if you were to transfer that to some sort of a record, you could actually use that. And in all probability, for most people, you would actually extend your times for um, required maintenance um, by actually using the time and service as opposed to just the raw tack time or the raw Hobbs time. Um, the other one is, is the owner and operator because the owner and operator is, has certain responsibilities here. Um, obviously, it's the legal owner counts as the owner of the airplane. You're on the registration, you're the legal owner. Um, operator, it can be a little bit fuzzier. Um, it's certainly for somebody that formally leases an airplane, that would be an operator um, while not being the owner. Uh, and typically, of course, the person, the, the person or entity that is responsible at that particular time. Um, the question can be come up as to whether, you know, a more casual owner or casual operator of the airplane, you know, like, for example, you know, somebody's son who actually flies the airplane more than everybody else, who's, who's the actual responsible person here. Um, the other two terms, another two terms here is the versus rebuilt versus overhaul. These have a tendency to be used kind of interchangeably. Um, but in truth, rebuilt is defined um, uh, by the FAA as, as specifically as disassembled, inspected, and repaired in accordance with maintenance instructions. And overhaul doesn't really have a hard definition. Um, though, when it comes to engines and things, there are certain things that have to be, um, uh, the, ma the uh, maintenance instructions, you know, require certain things be replaced and certain things being done. Um, but just because you've got an airplane engine that has been quote unquote overhauled, it doesn't tell you enough about what actually was done to the airplane. And then returning to service is the formal FAA term uh, for approving the airplane for return to service and is done with the maintenance entry. Um, and, you know, typically uh, it means that we have, you ha the maintenance shop has surrendered the airplane back to you. Ah, uh, who is responsible for the aircraft maintenance records? Well, believe it or not, it's not the mechanic or the IA. It is the owner or the operator. Um, in our case, you know, 99% of the time, it's going to be the owner. Um, and in my experience, a lot of owners pay very little attention um, to the records. They just hand the, the books off to the mechanics uh, for the annual inspection. They pick them up again, then they put them someplace. Um, and that can be uh, a big mistake. First of all, you need to talk about what are maintenance records. We tend to refer to them colloquially as log books, but they're not just limited to the bound paper books that normally pass for um, uh, maintenance records. I mean, it can be computerized. It can be, on, you know, on the airlines is all computerized. Um, uh, general aviation, at least until you get up into the corporate realms uh, and multi-million dollar airplanes have a tendency, you know, we still pretty much use the paper records. But you've got the log books themselves, which has the individual maintenance and inspection entries in them, but also 
um, the AD compliance sheets are part of the records and need to be maintained. Uh, FA forms 337, where the mechanic uh, or inspector has made uh, major alterations or major repairs, those get entered onto a 337, um, you know, which is often done with STCs, etc. All of those are part of the records and need to be held on to. Um, yellow tags and forms 8130-3, uh, colloquially called yellow tags, because that's what they all used to be, and now they're pretty much of uh, the actual form. Uh, but these are all uh, these are when sub, primarily when subcontracted work has been done on some component that your mechanic then installs. Um, those are part of the record. If, if, if your mechanic, um, you know, has told you you needed a rebuilt magneto um, and uh, you agree and he puts in a new magneto or a rebuilt magneto and he's got it entered in the logbooks, he uh, or she needs to give you the 8130-3 form that came with the work that was done um, on that magneto. As just an example, it could be any other component or accessory too. Uh, work orders, when they hand you the bill, uh, that very often becomes part of the maintenance record when the mechanic makes some kind of lame logbook entry, for example, something like, um, uh, you know, uh, overhauled engine, see details, work order number such and such. Well, he incorporated that work order by reference into the aircraft maintenance records, um, and you need to hang on to those. Um, and I would say that, you know, over the course of, of you know, an airplane's 50 year or, or longer life, most of those work orders that are referenced in the logbooks are no longer available. And it's understandable. Most, most owners don't realize that work orders can be maintenance records and they take it as a bill and they write a check and they stick it in their financial files. You know, three years later after they filed their taxes, they throw it away, but they're throwing away part of the aircraft maintenance. And it can be a very costly mistake too. Um, you know, very, I have a, managed to avoid for clients um, having to take their engines partially apart to determine whether an AED was complied with um, because there was no work order or no parts list of what was in the engine. But if there is, uh, and the owner provides the work order, and I can see that the part that was installed was not the one that, that was referenced in the AED, I can then sign the AED off as, as not applying to that airplane. Otherwise, you know, there's certainly been cases where I've had to take um, accessory cases off or even cylinders off to determine whether some internal part um, that is now under AD uh, had been um, uh, had been uh, uh, hit by an a hit by an AD or a service bulletin, etc. And sometimes there are other documents when you do an engine overhaul. Very often um, there'll be a parts list. A parts list should be maintained. That's part of the uh, of the work that was done on the airplane. Very often those, those, uh, those go by the wayside. Sometimes they're part of the work, or, the work order or the invoice and sometimes they're not. Uh, the FAA is very liberal in what actually legally needs to be required uh, to be maintained by the owner. Um, your records, your, the actual log book really, um, that has all the entries in them and the, the uh, uh, inspections and everything else um, can be, uh, has to be maintained uh, only for a year. Uh, records that contain total time in service for each uh, airframe and engine, current status of life limited parts, uh, time since last overhauls, um, required to be uh, items required to be overhauled, uh, current status of required inspections, etc. Uh, forms three three seven. So basically, you could get away with a signed off status sheet, and you could throw your logbooks away. Though you'd be throwing a lot of the value of your airplane right out the window if you were to actually do that. Um, so 
Again, logbook entries, you actually can, after a year, you can throw your logbook, you know, and you could throw all those old logbooks away. Um, uh, but I don't know anybody that does that deliberately. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, uh, all the uh, records in the previous slide have to be maintained permanently uh, for the aircraft. And obviously the easiest way to do that is just to hang on to the logbooks. Um, list of discrepancies from an annual can be discarded when the repairs are completed. That would be a circumstance where the airplane has come in, for, you've taken in for an annual inspection and the mechanic has done the inspection and signed it off by saying that the, um, you know, I certified that the airplane has been inspected in accordance with an annual inspection and a list of discrepancies have been comply, have been provided the owner. Um, that is basically uh, the mechanic saying that uh, uh, can't approve the airplane, you know, in, in, uh, to go back into service the way it is. Um, though any, after that, any A&P can, can uh, uh, correct the discrepancies and uh, uh, then the airplane is 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 back approved for return to service. Um, and entries or documents that have been superseded may be discarded. Now this is one area that you re reasonably can throw some stuff out. Um, and an example would be, um, you know, a yellow tag for uh, a magneto overhaul in 1978 um, that has now been overhauled like you know multiple different times. You you could. You can throw those yellow tags out or the, or the 8130s. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, for people that install a zero time engine, you know, they send the core along with the log books back to, uh, uh, back to Lycoming or back to Continental. And, um, you know, those, those then go away, uh, which is, you know, that's perfectly acceptable. You can, you can go back and call anything that has been uh, superseded without uh, without destroying the value of your airplane by discarding records. Uh, now, here's what you should expect from your mechanics, um, but rare, you know don't always get. Um, this is the actual you know language from FAR 43.9. This is the FAA telling the mechanic what they're required to do. Um, they're required to make a description uh, or reference data acceptable to the administrative work performed. This is the one that is very often not complied with. Um, you know, they'll, it'll just, um, you know, re replaced left main tire, which, you know, for a tire is not that big a deal, um, but it is kind of nice to, you know, to do it correctly, you'd say, you know, remove and replace right main tire in accordance with, you know, FA, uh, with, uh, you know, Piper or Cessna service manual, such and such. Um, and, you know, you can, at the end of a long list of things you can do, you can refer back to. Um, it becomes a lot more important when you're talking about things like, you know, that have their own maintenance manual, um, like, Twin heaters on twin engine airplanes, the engines themselves, uh, magnetos, they all have their own um, uh, maintenance instructions, maintenance manuals, and it, it, something like that is, uh, you know, remove left magne uh, magneto, uh, you know, replaced condenser and points, time magneto, oh, um, reassembled all in accordance with. Um, yeah, uh, you know, Bendix or TCM maintenance manual, such and such. Uh, data completion of the work is mostly, you usually in an entry, but every once in a while we find some that aren't. Um, the name of the person performing the work, um, um, and uh, the person, the the signature and certificate number, um, and kind of certificate held by the person approving the work. Um, Typically, that's the same. You know, the last two bullet points are the same person. So, you know, the the the, the signature, um, certificate number, and and you know, with A and P slash I A or whatever the case might be, is is uh, compliant and is usually what happens. Um, inspection entries are similar, but a little bit uh, um, 
the, uh, the type of inspection and a brief description of the extent of the inspection, um, calling it an annual inspection in accordance with uh, um, Appendix D of Part 43 is, is common and acceptable. Uh, it's uh, um, annual aircraft uh, inspected in accordance with you know, Piper inspection form such and such, uh, you know, is another way that you might see that properly entered. Um, the date of the inspection, the aircraft total time and service. Now, the total time and service gets missed a lot. Oh, um, usually they have a number in there, but not always. Uh, but usually there's a number, but it's often like tack time. And the, the tack time um, is not the aircraft's total time and service. Uh, a good maintenance annual uh, entry should have you know, the total time on the aircraft, the total time on the engines, time since major overhaul, etc. But at least the aircraft total time and service is a requirement. The signature certificate number of type uh, uh, and type of certificate held, and the magic words approving or disproving uh, return to service. And um, uh, as I said, you know, Hobbs time or tack time is is not legally acceptable. Um, it's done more often, you know, probably half of the annual entries I ever look at has just got a Hobbs or a tack time on it. And you have to go back in the records to try to figure out what the actual uh, time and service is. And that doesn't meet the requirements, but it's pretty common. And um, uh, unairworthy, um, uh, disapproving an uh, aircraft to return to service after an inspection requires a signed and dated list of discrepancies sent to the owner. I find an awful lot of those lists, you know, were just written out and they, they were not signed and dated. So, you know, years later, you're kind of wondering, you know, whether these actually got repaired or what even annual that they, that they fit with. Um, reasons for keeping good maintenance records is well, good logbooks help sell the airplane. Um, you know, I uh, uh, probably up to having done eight or nine of them this year already and uh, guarantee you that my clients are a lot more interested in, in uh, poning up something close to the asking price if the logbooks are in good condition or, or, or uh, complete or reasonably complete uh, and reasonably well organized. Uh, as the owner, when you get your airplane back with the logbook entry, you know, insist that the logbook entries are detailed enough so that you understand what was written. Um, if you as a layperson can, can you know, as, as the pilot and owner of the airplane, if you can read it and visualize what the mechanic did to your plane, then it's, then it's detailed enough. Um, other than logbooks, the ancillary records um, are, uh, are good to organize in, blinder, uh, in binders. 337s, AD compliance sheets, um, et cetera, um, are a lot easier to view, are a lot more impressive to anybody you're selling the airplane to, a lot more impressive to the FAA if there's ever looking at it. And it makes it easier for the I, if you have to change IAs on an annual, um, the more that they have to go digging in the logbooks to try to figure out where everything is at, the more they're going to charge you. Um, also, keep, an uh, keep a section for instructions for continuing airworthiness, which is a subject um, that I don't think a lot of owners understand. Um, the FAA didn't used to require um, holders of type, you know, of, of STCs or people applying for an STC for a supplemental type certificate to modify an airplane. Um, they didn't require um, them to um, produce the ICAs, the instructions for continuing airworthiness. Well, now um, the FAA has been requiring that for a number of years. And so every time you're installing an, a new piece of avionics or a new piece of equipment or something, it's going to come with uh, instructions for continuing airworthiness. The, your IA and the annual needs to review those to make sure that they're uh, um, being complied with uh, and have been complied with anything that's, that needs to be done to sign the airplane off for an annual inspection. Um, a lot of IAs are not very good about 
you know, looking for um, ICAs and complying with them, um, but the ones that are, they can spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out and making phone calls to get copies of, of instruction, uh, instructions for continuing airworthiness for all the fancy electronics um, that have been installed or the new, uh, uh, new speed mod or whatever. And, um, uh, you know, in fact, those, those things are sitting at, at the owner's home in a drawer or have been thrown out. Uh, anyway, um, losing your logbooks, uh, losing the aircraft maintenance records is kind of a disaster. Uh, and really some thought needs to be given. Um, most owners, in my experience, don't keep multiple copies. Uh, and logbooks realistically are pretty much impossible to recover unless you have copies. You might get some, uh, you know, you might be able to get your last, your mechanic to, to um, cough up copies of, of entries if they've kept them um, for previous, you know, for a couple, three previous annual inspections. And you can, you can potentially do some reconstructing. Um, but when it comes to trying to sell the airplane, um, you're going to take a huge hit unless you've got, and, and the easiest thing to do these days is just to photograph them. Um, it doesn't take a long time. Don't even think about taking them to the copy machine. Don't even think about taking them to Kinko's to be scanned. You know, it takes 15 to 20 seconds to scan a page and it takes one click, you know, and a fraction of a second to take a picture uh, of, of your logbook pages. Just take the logbook, uh, set it on the table with a cover open of airframe number one, take the picture, uh, open up the logbook to the first page, page has got writing, take a picture of both pages together, turn the page, repeat until you've gone through all the logs, uh, the AD compliance sheets and whatnot, and then you know, load those up into the, uh, uh, load those into the uh, cloud or put them on a thumb drive and stick them someplace. Uh, because gu guaranteed, you know, if you, if you lose the logs, if they're damaged in a fire, um, you know, they get soaking wet and you can't open them. Um, having that available to you uh, will, 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 save, will save your bacon, basically. Um, and without them, if, if, you, if you lose them because they're in your house and your house burns down and your airplane's in your hangar and now you've got no logbooks, um, you know, you can potentially end up having to redo the annual inspection, uh, redo ADs, um, or at least all the ADs be inspected for conformity. Um, you know, if you can't prove a status of a life limited part, you're going to have to throw it out and start over again. Um, and, you know, this could be fantastically expensive or practic you know, may essentially just uh, uh, ruin the airplane's value to the, to, the, to the point that you scrap it. Ah, uh, anyway, um, I, as I said, I've made many, many logbook reviews over the years, and I've, I've saved a few of these as kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we'll kind of go through some of the examples. Um, now, this is a very complete, um, you know, annual entry. Uh, it's well, well described what was being done to the airplane. Um, since it's a, st a sticker to go in the log books, of course, they put the end number, um, serial number, et cetera, and they've got the tack times and total times and everything. This is, um, this is the kind of thing, you know, that you should expect, including, um, you know, when the ADs are due, um, they, those can be kept on, the, on an AD compliance sheet and not in the, in the records, but make sure they sign it. If they did an AD and the annual, the logbook entry says, you know, see compliance sheet for, comp for compliance with ADs, you know, look back there. If you've paid, you know, sometimes up to thousands of dollars to have an AD complied with, make sure there's a, there's a signature with it in the uh, AD compliance sheet. Because if you got a, if you don't have a signature back there, um, and it's not referenced in the logbook entry that does have the signature, legally it wasn't done. Ah, uh, um, here's a here's a nice uh, annual entry. Um, and it's not a horrible one, except there's no tack time, no total time, no time in service, no nothing. Um, 
So, uh, you know, years later, it doesn't help you too terribly much. Um, uh, gotta love this one. Um, AD complied with repaired as required. Well, what repairs? You know, what was done to the airplane? I mean, it's a re required um, to put it in there. Down the road, I mean, the owner has no way to know. The pilot, the further pilots or further owners have no way of knowing what actually was repaired. So what, um, you know, what parts were actually replaced? Um, uh, and that then gives you an idea of, of, you know, whether it was done properly or whether it was just um, pencil whipped. Um, gotta love this one. Uh, and there's just tons of these. Um, usually when I see no maintenance entries, uh, especially if there's a succession of these without a whole lot of time in between them, I usually just assume that they, this is generally a pencil whipped annual. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, if you if you called up the called up the IA three days later and asked them what color the airplane, you just annually wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, uh, this is one of my this is one of my favorite ones. It's actually not a terrible entry except for one thing the airplane was on it the the actual engine on the aircraft that matched this logbook was a different serial number than this one and for 16 years ias just assumed it was a typographical um in this particular case there was um yellow tags and maintenance releases for independent components that don't match what he said here so it's more likely that that this airplane, ah, uh, um, its engine has it, has it, this entry got put into the wrong log books. Um, yeah, I gotta love this. I see this one a lot. All ADs complied with. All of them? You know, you, you got a 172 and you did the ADs for a 421? I mean, how'd you do that? <laughs> uh, you know, there, they want to. They want you to assume that they've somehow discovered um, all the ads that there were. Again, doesn't meet the requirements and doesn't uh, uh, doesn't um, doesn't help you in keeping track of what's going on with your airplane, and it isn't going to help you in ever trying to sell it. So, at any rate, um, it's generally in time for for owners to kind of take control of their airplanes maintenance records, uh, insist on on better um on better uh, uh performance from the mechanics in terms of the record keeping so that you can uh keep better records and at this point i'll take any questions that y'all might have seeing my camera here Which one? Well, that, that was great. Uh, th thanks a lot, Chris. So we have a couple questions here. Let's see. Um, da -da 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 -da. Tom, is the AD compliance sheet a formal FAA form? It is not. Um, a lot of the shops subscribe to a service where they will, um, they can get a printout of all the ones that might possibly apply to that aircraft with that particular engine and, and, and some of the major ones. Um, uh, you know, Avlog um, provides them if you've subscribed to their service. And, um, you know, there's nothing prevents an owner um, uh, or a mechanic for that matter from creating one free form. Okay, okay. That, that actually brings us into the second question. Robert O'Neill, Ablog is copyrighted. Is there a similar logbook that is available without copyright? Uh, no. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, it doesn't prevent you from, you know, creating one. I mean, there's the uh, the format that they use, um, uh, you know, as long as it's not using, you know, their trademarks and and you know, pretty much identical. But there's you can't really, you know, copyright a list. 
right. <laughs> um, which essentially is what that is. It's a list. <laughs> okay. okay. So you can, you know, you, you can get out Word and, and, and format it any way you want to. Okay. Uh, Stefan has a question. AD compliance sheets versus log entry for the AD. Um, what you'd like to have, and, and some IAs do it one way and some IAs do it the other way. What you'd like to have is a, um, uh, the AD compliance sheet basically lets you go back to the beginning of the airplane and show where all the ADs have been previously complied with. Um, and then, uh, especially the, the one-time ADs, um, keeping that in some sort of a list that then refers back to the logbook entry that says where it was, um, uh, where it was complied with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, on a Piper uh, Comanche, um, there's uh, uh, an AD on the fuel, um, the fuel vents, which was, you know, 68-13-03, which either can be done as a 100-hour inspection or you can have a kit installed to terminate the AD, which this is common, you know, across all uh, uh, manufacturers will often have, you know, ADs that, that can be terminated or they can be done as a, as a ongoing inspection. And the ones that have been terminated, you, you, it's good to have a list to say, okay, yeah, this one was, this one was complied with, this one was terminated by installing the kit, and you know, here's, here's, here's when they're done repetitively. Um, a lot of IAs will just keep um, track of the repetitive ones in the logbook entry itself. Would say, you know, complied with. Um, uh, AD 771321 paragraph B by replacing the um, bungee cords in accordance with the uh, Piper service manual next next due you know at date and and you know total time and service so that the owner can look at that and go okay um, you know I need to be thinking about this needs to be done in 100 hours or 300 hours or whatever the case may be. Okay. Okay. Let's see here, uh, Gordon. Recently, I did a pre-purchase inspection of logbooks log books on a Cessna 150. The airplane had been converted to a tailwheel configuration. The logbook entry quoted this modification as being accomplished in accordance with a particular FAA STC. There was no stamped STC paperwork showing the STC holder had approved this installation in this particular serial number no drawings, notes, etc. It appeared to me that someone had done this work without getting approval of the STC holder. No go on the buy. Um, well, the, the requirement for having the permission is a fairly recent one. That came into effect um, <clears throat> a little over 10 years ago. Uh, so any ones that were done prior to that, they did not re did not require that the um, uh, that the mechanic or shop that did the conversion did the uh, uh, STC did not require that there be permission. Um, there should have been at that point, however, you know, a three three seven form three three seven that described um, you know what they did. And unfortunately, you know, this is another area where owners have a tendency or the mechanics often don't even give the installation paperwork back to the owner after they've, you know, charged for doing this. Um, so that, you know, some poor IA down the line is trying to figure out whether something was done correctly. And the installation instructions, you know, are ended up in a, in a filing cabinet in, a, in the shop that did it, which hasn't no longer been around, you know, and, and so obviously that stuff went it ended up in a dumpster. And, right. and you know, it's, it's, it's really frustrating um, when you don't have the, um, the installation instructions as, you know, the follow on IA trying to determine whether this airplane was properly modified or not, and you don't have the installation instructions. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Stephen Hopper. 
what work order wouldn't you incorporate into the logbooks? Um, anyone that didn't, didn't, you know, reference, I mean, all if it said was annual inspection and here's the dollar part, you know, you can write a check. Um, you know, those I don't, um, but if they've got lists of parts and, and, you know, if they've got a list of parts and, and individual things that were done and all of that was listed in the logbook, then I wouldn't necessarily need to keep it. But it's really common for, you know, the annual inspection, you got the entry, they did like five or six things, but you look at the work order and they charge for like 20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, other than, you know, minor cosmetic things, you know, probably most of those should have ended up in the logbook entry. And in which case, you know, you'd be well advised just to tuck that into another, you know, another plastic slip case into your, into your binder. Um, Cause you, you know, you never know five years later an AD may come out on, on this particular thing. And you're like, I don't, is, is that in my airplane? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, or did they, you know, did they install the new one or did they install the old one that I now have to remove? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. N next question. Uh, should a post maintenance test flight be recorded in the airframe log box? Um, it depends on, on if, if it's, if it's something that's not being done like an STC that, that specifically requires, you know, a post maintenance test flight, then absolutely. Um, otherwise it's, it's optional. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, it's, you know, some people, some, uh, mechanics and I feel that, uh, um, you know, they feel better about taking the airplane up around the patch after they've worked on it just to, you know, make sure that they're, they're giving the airplane back to the customer, you know, with everything working and, and, you know, trying to catch any errors that the shop might have made. Mm -hmm. um, that's, again, that's not a requirement. Okay. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't need to be in the airframe log. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, I, I kind of on this note too, Rick uh, Hayes asked, when shopping for an airplane, what telltale signs in a log book would deter a buyer from purchasing the airplane? Oh boy. <laughs> um, yeah, if it was, if it was, if it was, if it was that easy to do, I'd write a computer program that <laughs> and, and sell it all to everybody who's going to buy the airplane. Um, in truth, you know, based on, you know, many, many years of experience with a particular airplane, um, you can build a picture of, of, of what the airplane has been through, what the general quality of the maintenance, because you pretty much know the airplane through its life cycle, about when, you know, what should have been done to the airplane, and you find out that, you know, it wasn't done to the, you know, you, you look, you're looking for stuff that hasn't been done. Um, the... Um, I guess if there's, I guess if there's one thing, um, uh, is I would look at, and it's usually one of the first things I look at when I'm doing, because potentially it can scotch the deal. Um, uh, I had a case with a, um, uh, with a 180 Comanche a couple, three years ago, uh, where... They sent me the sent me the logs, and the airplane was advertised um, as having X number of hours since overhaul. Well, the first thing I looked at was the last overhaul. It wasn't signed off as an overhaul at all. He basically took pieces out of three different engines and put them together. So, you know, with that, I sent you know called or sent an email to the to the client, and I said, you know, this airplane is not as it was advertised. You've got a Franken engine in here. Are you sure you want me to pay, look at the rest of the logbooks? And they went, oh, God, no. <laughs> and he went off screaming in the night, and I you know, deleted the logbooks and yeah. went on to the next project. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that, that was the shortest logbook review I think I've ever done. Okay. Uh, but, yes, you know, looking at, looking at the overhaul, I've had, you know, more recent where people have said the airplane had been overhauled. Well, you know, the, the, ah, uh, um, the, a mechanic hit, oh, the, an engine shop had split the case to replace the cam and called it a repair and not an overhaul. And then later he replaced all the cylinders and he wanted to call that an overhaul. And it's like, mm, it's not an overhaul. 
<laughs> you know, this, this isn't a 700 hour engine. This is a 1700 hour since major engine. Right. Yes, it's had a lot of work and yes, it probably will go further than TBO, but you know, you're the buyer. How lucky do you feel? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that buyer <Okay>. fled too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Norbert uh, has a question. Interesting. What is the best way to log an owner produced part? for older airplanes when parts are no longer available? Um, uh, the, there should be two entries. There should be the entry from the owner um, describing, um, there, there are a few requirements, one of which has to be met really to establish that it is in fact an, an owner um, produced part. And there's some gray area in the FAA's regulations on that. Um, but, you know, one, um, uh, uh, one perfect way to do it that has, has no, um, no issues at all is to say that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, I took such and such a part, I gave it to the machine shop, um, asked them to duplicate the part, I got the part back, I compared it to the old one, um, it appears to look, you know, um, uh, fit and, and function and dimensions and everything was, you know, was correct. Um, and then, you know, you, you sign that in the logbook as the owner and then the, the, IA, the mechanic or the IA is going to take it, um, inspect it and, and then sign off the, the installation of the part. But the owner is now taking responsibility for the part um, and the IA is not responsible for the work that was done unless it was just obviously defective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the owner hands you an aluminum part to replace what a steel part, you know, it's like, okay, you know, you can figure that one out, but right. you know, yeah. you're not, you're not held if, you know, the, the shop used a, a, defe a deficient grade of steel or something on, on, on the part. Uh, you can't really be expected to, uh, uh, the mechanic to be in, in required to inspect it to that degree. If it appears to be reasonably, um, uh, you know, an accurate reproduction, um, mm -hmm. then you're good to go as a mechanic to install it and then just say, you know, um, uh, you know, re removed, um, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, the part was, bracket such and such, um, and installed uh, owner produced parts, see above, see above entry from the owner. Um, and, and, you know, go on with the rest of your entry and return the airplane to service. Okay. okay. Uh, Steve Ellis has a question. Kristen, do you like AD log? I use it for, uh, he uses it. It's about 35 bucks a year. And he's, uh, let's see, he has spent, da -da -da -da, just, he's had it for about three years, I, I guess. Um, do you, have you used it? Yeah. Um, I have not for, uh, for my airplanes, um, I have not used it. Um, you know, it's usually it's usually about three hundred bucks or something like that to buy in, and then it's an annual, like you know, like he says, thirty five bucks a year or something. Um, you where they send you, you know, new sheets when ADs come out, so you get a um, you get a uh, uh, a notification from them as well as the FAA that you know this AD is, has come out. I, it's a good system. Um, it's, it's easy, uh, it's easy to maintain. What I find is that rarely does an owner, um, you know, maintain it throughout. Mm -hmm. At some point they tend, they have a tendency to get tired. So, you know, logbook number one, you know, was, was an old one from Piper and then, you know, logbook number two is the ad log and then they got halfway through the ad log and then they, they went back to old, um, I have yet to to look at an airplane that has been had ad log from day one through yeah. through. Uh, and it, that, that kind of with Steve's question, it was one of the things he's had it for the last three years, and he's had no a, new ads come through. So that's why I kind of wanted to know, you know, is it is a a good you know worth the money? I guess basically. So. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that's that's probably one of the reasons that you know people have a tendency to drop out of it. Um, we haven't had any new Comanche ads. Uh, since 2015. So, you know, they don't come through very regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Well, that kind of leads to another question. Uh, my 1980 Piper Warrior II, this is from Richard. Uh, the log books for airframe engine and propeller are just about full. Do you have any suggestions on how to best continue the log books? For example, airframe book two, prop book two, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, just by, um, I mean, what I do is, is um, uh, basically go up on the aircraft Spruce website or Sporties or something, and and you know order a fresh book and you know close that one out and you know make a notation that this is the start of logbook three, you know from such and such a date and take okay. it from there. Okay. Okay. Don Vancura said, "Is painting something that needs to be logged? Painting an aircraft?" Yes. It does. Yeah, it's certainly. It's uh, certainly maintenance, and you certainly want to know whether they've stripped the airplane. You certainly want to know, and certainly the FAA wants to know, if you've been painting control surfaces, did you go and balance those control surfaces after you're done? Oh, okay. Um, you know, so, um, you know, that's that's part of a complete job, and yeah, it certainly does need to be, certainly does need to be logged. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, also good to have, you know, what should be, as part of the maintenance records needs to be whether it came in a work order or came in a logbook entry is what colors they used and who manufactured the paint. So, you know, five years down the road, if you want to do some touch up, you know, the, uh, uh, you have some idea of where to get the proper paint to do a touch up. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Gordon uh, asks, there was an FAA 337 on the TW entry but it was not stamped by the FAA as a field approval. Don't think this is a proper entry. Um, if it has an STC, it does not need to be stamped. A field approval is when you don't have an STC um, to provide the approved data to make the alteration. Major repairs, major alterations need to have FAA approved data. Um, and a 337 uh, or a uh, STC is the FAA approving um, the installation as, as approved data, um, you know, based on the installation instructions that were provided. Okay. So it does not have to have a, a uh, the field approval is when you want to make a change that you don't have a 337 for. Okay, okay, thank you. And I think to wrap it up, we have one last question from Rick. Uh, how do we contact you? if we need your service in the future? Um, well, pretty much uh, every, uh, uh, every um, slide there had my email address on it. It's Kristen at theaviatrix.com. Yeah. But um, now we're just about ready to uh, yeah. draw for the gift certificate, but I wanted to thank yeah. Kristen. Yeah, for the for time. Uh, very informative, great yeah. seminar. Thanks for being here. I wanna thank Aircraft Spruce for helping to sponsor this and provide the gift certificate. Mm -hmm.